talking about um, pack results um, and the idea of making good decisions on all but a finite number of time steps. And I also just wanted to mention that um, a couple of colleagues came up to me afterwards and pointed me to some additional literature um, on that I should include on Gittins indexes, um, which I should add a slide in on about when is it, it is sort of computationally tractable to compute <coughs> a phase optimal solution for bandits. To my knowledge, there is no equivalent of efficiently computable Gittins indexes for RL, but if anybody knows of one, definitely let me know. And then also on relating um, Bayesian regret to frequentist style regret bouts, um, and I'll add in some additional slides about that. Okay, so the, this was sort of um, pack style guarantees where we're gonna be making uh, good decisions on all but a finite number of time steps. But another approach is to think about regret. So regret, and there's, there's a number of different, slightly different notions of regret. Um, one notion of regret here is to say, what is sort of um, the best policy we could be following um, that would maximize as t goes to infinity um, our expected sum of discounted rewards? So imagine that we could do that maximization. Um, how would that compare to the actual rewards that we got by following our algorithm? And that gives us a notion of regret, a notion of how much we've lost um, uh, by following the policy that we followed or using the algorithm that we used instead of following the optimal policy from the very beginning. One of the things that's a little bit subtle about that um, is that these could be evaluated along different sequences of states. So just to be precise there, in the PAC setting, what PAC says is for the state that you end up in, we will always make a decision that is near optimal for that state, except for, for a finite number of times. So you get to be evaluated along the actual states that your algorithm goes to. This is harder in a way, right? This is saying, no, I'm gonna evaluate you potentially on two completely, entirely different state sequences, because it might be that if you made a bad decision initially, that you go to an entirely different part of the state space, and you do much, much worse there. So in, in general, that you, it could be that you make a decision initially, and it's completely unrecoverable. You didn't go to the Simon's workshop and your career is ruined. So like, <laughs> you know, there are these, so this is quite a strong notion of what it means to be optimal, right? And so it, um, these tend to be rate bounds in terms of as a function of the number of time steps. Um, and in general, if we don't make any assumptions about the MDP, these often can be linear. Not always, but um, uh, for the example that I just gave. So it might be that you could have made an optimal decision on the first time step, and if your state space is sort of not communicating or not well mixing, then you might never be able to recover from that initial decision. There are a number of algorithms that we do have nice regret bounds for. Yep. Uh, quick, can I go back for a second? What's the limit over limit of t? Should I, t is an argument of delta. So isn't the limits that's Sorry? There's, oh, you mean, I? yeah, so I mean a little bit, I'm going back and forth between, yeah, so I'm going back, it's a good point, I'll revise that. Line. So they, they actually define this in terms of average regret, so they define that in terms of one over t, but then when they're calculating the regret experienced by the algorithm, then they multiply by that t. So I was going to originally put this just in, times of, in terms of the total regret, which will always be finite because you will only have an hour time, but it's a good point. I will rewrite that in terms of the average regret, which you can then multiply by the number of time steps for any finite algorithm. So, so for UCRL2, um, this is an optimism under uncertainty algorithm, um, which makes an assumption about the underlying MDP. And in particular, it assumes that the diameter of the MDP is finite, and it's um, characterized by d. And so what the diameter means is that the number of time steps that it would take you to go between um, two states is bounded um, under some optimal policy. As long as there are slightly different uh, definitions of diameter, the one that we use most commonly in my work is to say, what is um, under some, under the best policy, what is the max number of expected time steps would it take for you to go from one state to another state? And then you take a max under over all possible state pairs. So you can think of that as a notion of the distance 
in the MDP. Of like, how long could it take you to go between one state to another state if you were just trying to get to that other state? Um, and then you can get an expectation over that, like the expected number of time steps. So if you have finite diameter, which means essentially that you can get from any state to any other state, so you can't sort of make a bad decision initially and end up in a disconnected <coughs> part of the state space, then they have the following regret bound. And they have um, an upper bound that says, with probabilities 1 minus delta, your regret is going to scale linearly in D, linearly in the size of the state space, and with the square root of the size of the number of actions, the t, and then log of t divided by delta. They also have another one, which will look very different. It's log in t. Um, but this is making an additional assumption that we often don't have access to. And this thinks about the gap. And the idea in the gap is, and again, there's sort of slightly different uh, definitions of gap depending on the literature you look at. But the gap that I tend, to, I tend to think of gap is essentially just representing what is the difference between the optimal policy and then the value of um, the next best policy for a state action pair. So intuitively, if that's really, really small, then it might take you a lot of data to sort of distinguish between what the best action is for a particular state. But if it's large, then it should be pretty easy to tell what the best action is to do in a state. Sorry. Yep. So there are two different things, right? One is uh, it, you may not have access to this information, but the algorithm is oblivious. So you, you can define an algorithm that could say, um, leverage this. Um, in this case, UCRL2 uh, is just, a, you could say, this is how it's going to scale. You just don't know what G is. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, this is sort of how the regret will be, but you wouldn't necessarily know what this would be because you don't know what G is. Now, there's some algorithms which you can actually estimate G and use that to guide exploration. So, but this is much, much better. So what this is saying is that if you know what that G is, that basically the, the regret scales as a function of that gap rather than like this. This is sort of entirely oblivious. This is the max gap. And then this is the lower bound. Now, this algorithm uses optimism in the face of uncertainty by sort of keeping upper bounds over the Q function, essentially. It uses a smoother version of knownness than the first version I uh, talked about. Essentially, um, you can define confidence intervals or confidence sets of the transition dynamics and the reward model. And then you can be optimistic with respect to those sets when you're computing the value function. But you don't have to just be um, sort of have a, a step function in terms of how good you think the world is. So instead of saying, if I don't know it, everything is fabulous, else I use the empirical distribution, you can say, given the confidence intervals I have, this is the best the world could possibly be so far, and then propagate that information into the Q function. Yeah. This G. Uh, could you explain that again? The best non-optimal policy for any state? Yeah, so the way that I think of G is the difference. If you look at Q star of SA, this is A star minus max over <coughs> A prime not equal to A star. It's the difference between the value you get not quite in this case, because in this case, we're going to be talking about average reward. But in general, it's um, the difference between the value of the best action and the value of the next best action. Next back, next back, best action. But that's still with respect to the optimal policy. There's a star there, right? Yes. And this is, but the yes. words, don't, it's like best non-optimal policy. Well, so this wouldn't be optimal here, right? Because taking that A no, prime would no longer be the optimal. Right. That's so it's the best non-optimal action. And then there are other bounds that use others. So um, Peter Bartlett's group has an algorithm called Regal that uses uh, a, a different quantity instead of the diameter. It uses the notion of the span. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, to get also nice regret bounds in this type of framework. Now there's similar results in the multi-arm bandit study. Um, and in fact, you can show bounds for the e-greedy case as well. So one of the nice things in the multi-arm bandit situation is that exploration is easier because you don't have to worry about computing, like communicating state spaces because at least in the basic situation, there is no state space. So you are always able to explore all of the arms. So you don't need notions like the diameter. You can also define things like Bayesian regret. 
So in the case of posterior sampling for reinforcement learning, there was an algorithm that was, I think, the earliest um, uh, instantiation that I'm aware of is Strens from 2000, where what they proposed you could do is maintain a distribution over the RL parameters and then sample from that and then solve the resulting MDP and act accordingly. But at the time, there was no theoretical guarantees known for that strategy. And then Ian Osband and Ben Van Roy and uh, Dan Rousseau showed that you can give sort of Bayesian <coughs> regret bounds for that setting, where you're Bayesian with respect to the, sort of the distribution of MDPs that you might encounter. You can get a bound that scales like this. And they showed that if you sort of look at this in some of the standard domains, that you get much better um, regret bounds compared to UCRL2. So empirically, it seems like Thompson sampling often, or posterior sampling style approaches, can often be very powerful. But I just want to highlight here, and this goes a bit to one of Dan Roy's comments earlier, this is still linear in the state space. So when your state space is infinite or your state space is very, very large, um, this could still be a really, really large regret. So and that brings us to, well, what if we've got an enormous state space? All of these bounds that we're talking about so far are scaling at least linearly in the state space. And we know that at least in the pack setting that that's, <coughs> there's lower bounds, that it means it has to be at least linear in the state space if you don't make any other sort of assumptions about the domain. So an alternative is, um, the following, where we try to do sort of the best with respect to a class. So again, if we go back to the bandit setting, um, again, remember we had the arms, we wanted to maximize uh, the cumulative reward. So we could think about a slight variant of this called contextual bandits. And the idea in this setting is it's a little bit closer to the RL setting, but not all the way there, in the sense that at each time point we see a context. <laughs> and that context is sampled. And the action that we take is not going to affect the context that we get next time unlike the RL setting. So at least in the basic contextual bandit setting, where each time point we're going to sample a context that's going to be given to the agent, and then they have to make a decision. But what decision they make is not going to influence the next state. So at each time point, they're going to see a context, they're going to select an arm, and they're going to get some reward. And now the reward is going to be a function of both the action and the context. And again, the goal is, as before, to maximize the cumulative sort of distribution, uh, maximize the cumulative reward over t poles. Now, the key idea of this is to say, well, we'd really like to start being able to do some generalization or some sharing across our state space, particularly if our state space is enormous, or maybe also across our action space, if our action space is enormous. And so can we make different assumptions over what this sort of unknown distribution of rewards is as a function of A and the context? So for example, one thing you could assume is that it's linear, that the expected reward given a context is just the dot product between your context, which is represented as a set of features, and some parameters theta. So the nice thing about this is that in this case, also we can do some reduction to supervised learning. So we could assume that we just have a set of policies, which could be, for example, cost-sensitive classifiers. And then Miro and John Langford and a bunch of other people showed that they can efficiently compute um, a, a, a good solution in this case. We're, we're getting a regret bound, which um, is going to scale as log of the size of the policy class. <coughs> the policy class still could be very large. Um, but if you make an assumption that you've got sort of that you're, you might be able to get away with a smaller policy class, then this could be pretty good. And then they show that computationally, that they're only polylog inside of, in terms of the size of the, the policy class. So this is basically sort of relaxing the assumption that we're going to be able to, well, you can go in in either way. You can either assume that whatever class that you pick is expressive enough to really cover the optimal policy, and then you sort of lose some of the benefit of this, um, because often the size of the policy class will have to be exponential. Um, so in particular, it might need to be exponential in um, the, like it could be the size of the number of actions, the size of the state space. If you wanted to be able to enumerate every single possible action for every single possible state. And so now you have an exponential policy class. Um, and so then this log term, you would end up getting still at least a square root dependence on x. It's not exactly a free lunch. Um, but if you've got a much smaller policy class, then you might be able to do much, much better. And in fact, that's probably going to be critical for any large state space. 
So, but in terms of what the regret bound means in that situation, either it means that you're going to be doing sort of a regret with respect to the optimal policy within the class, or you're sort of making a realizability assumption that in fact the optimal policy exists within that class. Okay, so those are sort of like the broad ways that um, people have been evaluating the performance of algorithms, ignoring sort of computational uh, constraints. And now I'm just going to talk about some of the different sort of current and future directions. And I know Sergey will talk about some of this more later today. So the ones that I'm going to talk about um, is sort of off policy. I'm going to start with off policy policy evaluation because I think it's a really important topic, and um, it's one that I and a number of people have been working on recently. And it's a function both of sort of online learning and offline learning, and I'll talk about that more in a second. So the idea in off policy policy evaluation is pretty simple. The idea is that we have the old data that was gathered using one or more behavior policies. Our agent's been acting in its domain, it's been gathering data, and we want to estimate what the performance would be of an alternative policy. So we thought about this problem in the case of an educational game. So this is an educational game for teaching kids about fractions. They can split laser beams um, using different fractions, and then um, And one of the questions that we wanted to look at in this case is sort of what levels do we give students when? So there are different types of fractions, um, and then there's sort of different spatial relationships. And so the question is sort of what level do we do at which point um, in order to keep the students engaged and learning? Um, engagement is a really big challenge in this case. These are sort of free online games, so people drop out uh, pretty quickly, and so we wanted to keep them learning and engaged. And so we did off-policy evaluation. We had access to some semi-randomized data. And we could use this um, sort of doing off-policy reinforcement learning in order to find a policy that had 30% higher engagement than the previous uh, best policy. And one thing that I thought was really interesting about this is that the previous best policy um, actually was worse than random level selection. Um, so we did an analysis of this, and then we did a 2,000-person experiment to check the analysis. And I think that. Um, you know, this was put together by game designers and um, some education people. And I think it really just highlights that in some of these really complex state spaces, human intuition can sometimes fail about what is the best thing to do. And so it's really nice in these situations where we have a lot of data to be able to sort of get to better solutions using reinforcement learning, um, because sometimes the results are surprising compared to what we would expect. Question. Yeah. What, what is the state space here? And is it observed? Yeah, so it's a great question. So in this case, the state space was, um, a bunch of different features about the gameplay, um, and then we assumed it was observed, but not necessarily correct. So we'll talk about that in a second. So we're, we're making some assumption of how we're going to model the domain, but we're not going to assume that's actually Markov. And there's no state space in terms of frustration of the user. It could be. So we could throw in those features we didn't hear. Um, we didn't, but, you know. I mean, those would not be observed, or. Actually, there are different detectors for trying to look at that in terms of, you know, like what is people's speed of typing and like clicking and stuff like that. But again, that's all sort of a latent state, and then you're trying to get detectors for that. You said the other policy or what previously people did was worse than random. So yes. how did this compare to random? It's also it's a yeah, so it's also thirty percent higher engagement than random, and then the other one was statistically and significantly worse than random, but slightly. So how would we do this? So one thing we could do is we could assume the domain specification is correct. And what I mean by domain specification here is we're going to assume we have as input some old data that's gathered using one or more behavior policies um, <coughs> and a state action space. So someone gives us a state action space that says these are the features that um, we're using and that we're going to assume it's Markov. The domain is Markov and the state action space that we've got is Markov. And so given that, we could, you know, there's many different approaches, but one is to do the model-based approach. So we could do maximum likelihood estimation of a model and then compute um, the Q function of the policy we want to evaluate. Or we could do model-free learning, like Q learning, and um, compute the Q of the policy we want to evaluate. Because Q learning is an off-policy method. Yeah. Um, so the point here is that you have a specific policy you want to evaluate. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so in this case, so we also might want to do the policy search. So you might want to do this for many different policies and then pick. So this is good in the sense that um, it tends to have a pretty low variance estimator of the <coughs> evaluation policy's performance. Um, you can think of essentially here, at least the top is basically making a simulator, and the bottom is doing model free Q learning. Um, and the downside is that it isn't an unbiased estimator. <laughs> so in particular, the specification that we use might be wrong. So it might not be Markov. 
for the states, you know, um, uh, might be a very poor approximation. As a really trivial example of this, you can imagine that we would just model all students as having been in a single state all the time. So if we just say there's one state that the students are in all the time and maybe they're always bored, um, then if we had a lot of data, we could get a very low variance estimate of what that policy would be, but it would just be entirely wrong, It'd be incredibly biased. So this is a low variance estimate of a policy's performance, but it can be highly biased. And so therefore also it's not consistent in this case because um, we're relying on the specification when we're computing these. And so even in the limit of infinite data, if I assume that my students are always in a single state, I'm not gonna converge to the true value of the um, evaluation policy. So an alternative is to do important sampling. Um, and this was first proposed, important sampling is a general technique, I'm sure many of you know, but, um, but it was first proposed for reinforcement learning uh, by Precup, Turner Precup and colleagues. And the idea is basically to reweight your observed distribution by the probability of observing it under your evaluation policy compared to your target policy. So let's say RJ here is the total return, total number of rewards you got on the jth trajectory. Let's imagine we have a series of trajectories. So like the agent acts in the world for h steps. They reset, they act in the world for h steps. And each of those, you get a total reward. And then we reweigh that reward by the probability we would have seen it under the evaluation policy compared to the behavior policy. So the nice thing about doing this is that it's unbiased. So we're not making any assumptions. We're not even assuming that the world is Markov. Um, and it's strongly consistent. That's great but it's hugely high variance in general. So this is a ratio, and you can break this down, but uh, particularly as you keep doing this for longer and longer horizons, these products can blow up in either direction. They can either go to zero or they can go to near infinity. And so these estimators are typically super high variance. So a natural idea is, well, could we get the best of both worlds? Um, and this has been thought about in statistics before, and it's known as doubly robust estimators. Um, and the idea is, well, let's just combine the best of these two things. We want sort of things that are both lower bias and also lower variance. Um, and so Dudek and colleagues did this for bandits. And then more recently, Nan Xiang and Li Hong Li did this for reinforcement learning. But they still made sure that the estimator was unbiased. So they're combining these two estimators, but in a way that ensured that the resulting estimator was still unbiased. And what our insight was is that you might be willing to tolerate a little bit of bias in order to have a much better mean squared error. So we recently had a paper called Magic where we're blending together important sampling-based estimators and model-based estimators to directly minimize the empirical mean squared error. And the idea is that we could combine between using the model and important sampling to estimate the return of a policy. So what you could imagine doing is just using important sampling to estimate the reward of the first time step and using the model to estimate the reward of all subsequent time steps in say a h step trajectory. And that would give you a large bias in the resulting estimate, but it would be low variance. So this is basically almost entirely like the model based estimator. And an alternative would, would be to say, okay, I'm gonna use important sampling to estimate the, re the return of my policy for almost all time steps, and maybe the very last time step use the model. And then that would give you low bias, but high variance. And in general, you could just go back and forth between these. So you could sort of say, the first two time steps, I um, use the important sampling estimator for the first three time steps of my trajectory, I use the important sampling based estimator, and just essentially smoothly vary between using important sampling and using a model based estimator for every single time step in your trajectory. And then we could just put weights over those all of these different returns, each of these returns are just blending together between two different statistical estimators. And then we can just model the mean squared error as being a combination of bias and variance. And then what we want to do in this case, and again, just to note here, this policy value is just using a particular weighting of the model estimate and the important sampling based estimate. Now, the key challenge to doing this is, well, where do we get this bias and this variance? Um, in general, so the, the bias in this case is going to be the difference between our estimate and the true value. So if we could exactly compute the bias, we would have to know what the true value was. But the whole point is that we're trying to compute the true value. So what we ended up doing is to do a conservative estimate of the bias based on a confidence interval around our important sampling-based estimator. 
And essentially what this will do empirically is it means you may overtrust the model sometimes. You're going to underestimate the, um, the model bias. And so you may sort of preferentially pick the model sometimes. But empirically, we see that sometimes this can lead to orders of magnitude lower mean squared error compared to some prior approaches where it's specifically not, not unbiased, so it can be biased, but we can get much tighter estimates of the accuracy, uh, or t much tighter estimates of the policy's performance. So this idea of trying to sort of get leverage important sampling, but trying to get, sort of get rid of the really, really horrible um, long variance, um, uh, large variance, um, has started to pick up steam over the last year or two. So there's been some nice recent work from Remy Munoz and colleagues over at DeepMind. But they've also been thinking about this, and they have a slightly different way of framing it, but um, it's related. So um, in this case, remember, though, from a while ago, we talked about the TD error, which was the difference between the immediate reward and your discounted sum of the future reward minus your current estimate of the Q function. So you can think of weighing this. It's a little bit complicated um, in terms of but the high level idea here is that you could think of sort of um, taking the long horizon of future rewards you get and reweighing them just like in important, important sampling with some product of probabilities of the evaluation policy versus probabilities of the um, behavior policy. And the question is, is that in general, we know that this can result in the, uh, in the estimate being very, very high variance. And so people have been thinking about different ways to sort of change how they weigh these terms in order to get better performance. So remember, important sampling in this case is just going to be directly taking the probability of the action under our behavior policy divided by the pro or evaluation policy divided by the probability of our action under the, value, the behavior policy. And the problem with this was its high variance. Another approach that um, recently came out of DeepMind was to say, we'll ignore this entirely, just have a lambda parameter. Well, notice this lambda parameter is basically going to be raised to an exponent of t, which essentially just means that you're going to sort of discount really long trajectories. You're going to discount the reward of those. So it's not going to blow up to infinity because you're just you're sort of rapidly discounting what are known as these traces. So that's a reasonable thing to do, but it, can, it means that um, if your, pol your resulting policy you're trying to evaluate is quite different than your behavior policy, it may just fail. You may not get a very good estimate at all. Another approach called tree-based lambda um, does sort of an interesting thing. They look at what was the probability under your evaluation policy weighed by lambda. It's sort of strange. Um, the weird thing about it can empirically often do quite well. The strange thing about this is that if you're just trying to estimate the performance of the same policy you use to gather the data, you're not going to get a very good estimate because you're going to get this up to the exponent of t. So if you're actually doing on policy evaluation, like if you've got data from the same policy that you want to evaluate, all of your important sampling Ratios should be one. So if these are exactly the same, this should be one. And so then you're not getting any problem with longer horizons because you're just multiplying one a bunch of times. And what they're doing here, you're multiplying by lambda and the probability of the action under your evaluation policy, which means you're sort of decaying the, the results of rewards that are far away. So it means it's not very efficient on policy. You're just going to get sort of higher variance estimates than you could have gotten um, even with an important sampling-based approach. And then in what the algorithm that they propose doing is they kind of take a combination of these two, where they look at sort of the minimum of one and the ratio between the evaluation and the behavior policies. But at a high level, I guess what I would say they're trying to do in this case is they're trying to balance between the fact that they can get very high variance terms by doing this product of important sampling ratios, and they want to sort of cut those really high variance returns. And one way to do that is to sort of terminate these long horizon traces. But when you do that, you can run into certain problems in terms of you can kind of end up throwing away a lot of your data. And so they're trying to find sort of um, a middle ground between these. <laughs> Why is it not min over lambda? Yeah, that? I don't know. I don't know if they experimented with that um, in terms of the different ways to do it. I mean, I think they're still making sure here by having the lambda that they're going to be terminating um, 
you know, fairly quickly. I mean, this is, instead of, they're not going to get this decay. They're only going to have one. So it'll be more like tree-based. Um, but it means that they could decay in places where this wouldn't. So, I mean, empirically, they did this. So this, um, they did their, some, some analysis of this. Uh, they can show that this operator, using this is still a contraction, so they can guarantee to converge to something. Um, but I don't have good intuition over what sort of theoretical guarantees you could hope to achieve in this case, basically. Mm -hmm. But even the, absent the theoretical guarantees, is there like standard test beds like they have for deep learning, you know? Atari. Atari. So yep. So they did Atari for this. So um, they then compared doing DQN, like deep Q Q networks, <coughs> to retrace and showed they could get much better results. So I feel like the standard, like, it's changing a little bit right now, but sort of probably the, the biggest standard for the last few years has been Atari. Atari. So that's what they did. Yeah. Um, particularly since Remy's at DeepMind. So. so, but people, it's not normal to report numbers, like, in, so there's a number. That yeah, so no, I have, I didn't put them in here, but I have graphs of the, where they compare, they compare at least um, retrace to deep Q networks. Um, they're sort of looking at two cases. They're looking at doing just offline evaluation, and then they're also looking at doing online learning, where if you're doing Q learning, it is off policy because you're constantly changing your policy over time. Um, and so they show sort of what their performance is like as a function of the number of data points. And essentially what they're trying to show here, I think, is that they're more sample efficient. Like with the same amount of data, they're going to sort of get a better estimate of the Q function. So Q function. what's the performance metric in those empirical things? Just reward, like cumulative reward. reward. Yeah, just cumulative reward. Yeah, and so what they'll often show, I mean, like DQN should converge to the same place. They're using the same sort of architecture, but they should get a jumpstart performance because they should need less data to get to that point. So I think one thing that's still a really big open challenge in this setting is long horizons, where you get a reward at the end. So imagine that, so the case that we were just talking about before, um, you know, we're basically decaying so that rewards that happen near the end, we're sort of discounting so that they don't, um, we don't get this uh, variance that depends on the length of the horizon, which we can show can be kind of exponential. Um, so, but the problem is, is that in some cases, the only signal we get is at the end. So in some of the cases that I look at, I look at intelligent tutoring systems where what we care about is maximizing, for example, uh, post-test performance. I mean, really, we'd like even longer horizon stuff. But at minimum, we'd like post-test performance as opposed to sort of within tutoring system performance. And it's not crazy long horizon, but it might be on the order of 60 to 100 time steps. And for 60 to 100 time steps, um, important sampling is just going to be impossibly high variance with any of the number of samples that we get um, in terms of number of students. Now, retrace doesn't solve this because they also will essentially cut off these long rewards. Um, and our approach, like magic, will basically reduce the model-based estimator. It'll say the variance of your important sampling estimator is incredibly large. You're just basically going to weight towards the model-based. So if you've got a good model, that's OK. But if the, if the model isn't very good, then you know we're going to have a low variance, very bad estimate. And so I think it's a really interesting issue about how do we do off-policy unbiased estimates where you have this, where it really is important to think about the long horizon. So one of the things that we're thinking about within this right now is how do we use options? How do we use sort of temporal abstraction to try to effectively reduce the horizon over which we're making decisions? Another big theme that came up in sort of European, in the European workshop on RL um, that happened last month at MIPS was safety and risk sensitivity. So most of the work historically in reinforcement learning has focused on the expected return of a policy. But we might want to be able to make guarantees on what that expected return is. So we might want to be able to compute confidence bounds on the expected value that we learn. In particular, my postdoc, Phil Thomas, has done work on this um, with uh, a number of colleagues at Adobe, where what they would like to be able to say is, you've got some old data about say, consumer marketing, and we want to be able to train a new policy, and we want to be able to guarantee with high probability that the new policy is going to yield higher revenue. And so then you want to be able to compute expected, uh, you want to be able to compute confidence bounds on the expected value. So I feel like there's been a number of people that are starting to think about that, and I think it could really reduce the barrier to people being able to deploy these in some of the high-risk settings. Another thing is that often we don't care about expected return alone. 
So in reality, whenever we run the algorithm once, there's going to be a distribution of returns. Um, and we know, to go to some of the comments for earlier, we know that people are sensitive to loss more than uh, to reward. And so we might want to think about sort of what that distribution is and maybe how much of it could be negative um, and be able to bound different functions of the distribution of the return. And so I think this is also a really interesting question. Um, I think related to this is something that people think about more in, you know, stock market domains, um, which is what is going to be the potential return of a single trajectory? not averaged because like if I'm going to retire, you know, if I'm going to retire, I only get to experience that trajectory once. I can't average over retiring 50 times. So in some cases we might want to have, you know, bounds over uh, the single instance of a trajectory. So in the retirement case, what's the state? So in the retirement space, the state could be like my, portf uh, my portfolio of stocks and then the actions would be which stocks to sell or buy. And then I would have a time horizon of, 40 years or whatever, and then, um, but I want guarantees over one realization, not averaged over if I was to do it 100 times. Got it. So another interesting issue here is that most of the work that's been happening so far in kind of the safety and risk sensitivity situation is for batch learning. So the assumption is that we've got some prior, prior amount of data and then we want to be able to make guarantees over the performance in the future or sort of do the planning problem of like the distribution. Um, but in reality, we might want to make guarantees about online learning. So I might want to be able to say, while I'm training my robot, I can guarantee with high probability I'm not going to break it. Um, and this has been much less well explored. I mean, all of this is pretty current. Um, there's been some nice recent work, recent-ish work from Peter's group. But in general, I think there's a big open question about how can you do learning and still sort of make guarantees as you learn, particularly if you don't have that much prior information. All right, so one elephant in the room that I have not talked about at all so far is deep learning. Um, and uh, probably all of you guys have seen these results. They're really phenomenal. Um, uh, DeepMind has had some really lovely results on scaling up to extremely large domains. So in this case, they're using just pixel input of Atari games, the last four frames of the Atari game. Sometimes they're slightly spaced, but essentially the last four frames, and then using it to make decisions about what's the next action to do in order to maximize reward. And they got really nice results over a whole bunch of different games. And what I mean by really nice results there is competitive with like good human performance. They also had very nice results on Go, showing that they beat one of the world masters in Go. Um, and this, as was pointed out before, Go in many ways is just a planning problem. Um, it's a really, really hard planning problem. Um, but they did use reinforcement learning um, as part of this. And the interesting idea in that is, so. Their approach is using Monte Carlo tree search, which is a planning technique. But it turns out that if you have a really, really large state and action space, the way you expand sort of your expecting max tree matters a lot because your tree is enormous. And so they're using reinforcement learning to kind of put priors over what actions to consider first and also as a way to estimate the value function. And so that um, made a big difference in terms of the competitiveness of the resulting Go player. Uh, uh Question. So, aren't they also using some kind of a, 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 a latent variable kind of approach to model states or something? I think they just use as input the game, like the current game state. Yeah. Oh, I mean Atari or something. Yeah. Over oh, Atari? Mm -hmm. So, not for the, not for at least the original DQN. It was just the set of pixels. Yeah. For the just last the la, last four set of sets of pixels. Last four. Steps. Last four frames. So they've sort of got a little bit of history there. So, for example, if you've got the last four frames. Sometimes those are space frames, but you could get velocity or maybe acceleration. I see. Because um, that's often pretty important. OK, so this has been phenomenal. Um, and the question is, you know, why has this happened over the last couple of years? So this is my perspective on this. So I think you know, a lot of the work in reinforcement learning over <laughs> tables, not tabules, but um, uh, has been focused on sort of tabular domains or sort of linear combinations of features or some work on dynamic base nets. Um, and all of these are somewhat limited in their expressive power. But in the early 90s, people did think about using neural networks to do, uh, to do um, reinforcement learning. And we knew, you know, there's more recent work from about a de decade ago saying, hey, we can just use some functional approximator 
could be a neural network, it could be any other form of supervised learning or regressor to represent the value function. I think the challenge was is that in the middle of the 90s, people noticed that if you use, that many common function approximators are what are known as non-non-expanders. So what does that mean? That means that um, when you apply them, you can think of projecting your value function back down into the space that's representable from your function. And when you do that projection, it might expand the difference between your two different Q functions. So if you have Q function one and Q function two, and you do a backup, and then you need to project them back into, say, a linear representation or a neural network representation, the distance they are in reality might get expanded when you do that projection back down. And the problem with that is that the Bellman operator is a contraction, but if you have an expansion in addition to that due to the projection, then you may not converge. So this was noticed, um, and there were cases where sort of the value function was oscillating, and I think, I don't know, that's my guess for one of the reasons why some of the interest in this went away. And I think there's you know, many other factors going on. There was sort of a, a recession in neural networks in general, but I think that was one of the concerns. But in practice, it does extremely well. So there's been a few more um, sort of insights recently that can help with some of these stability issues. One thing, too, is that we now have enormous data. So if we have enormous data, we can fit pretty complicated functions. And neural networks are great for representing really complicated functions. Um, and we could do things like replay, like sort of reuse our data, um, and uh, other tricks to kind of keep the value function or the Q network or the models more stable. So for example, you could train kind of a policy network and train a value function network and only update some of them periodically or sort of do replay, but like jump data out of order to try to get around overfitting and oscillation. And in practice, things are doing incredibly well. Yeah. Um, so was there anything done in the Atari work to address this issue that you, the contraction property might? <coughs> not that I know of. Not in, the, not in the nature paper. I mean, they're doing the replay for the stability, but I don't, not that I know of. How complicated are those deep nets, the approximators? How big are they? Maybe, maybe it's just a sufficiently powerful one so the expansion doesn't happen. Well, I mean, I think in this case, I'm sure it could happen, because even it could happen in the linear case. So I think, I mean, I think these are probably on the order of 13 deep. I mean, they're, they're pretty big networks. 13. 13 deep, I think. Like, I don't know how many nodes per layer, but, um, but they're, I mean, they're pretty big networks. representing basically everything, right? Yes. Well, the, you can represent everything with two, but yes, yeah, like certainly, no, no, I guess. I mean, <laughs> yeah, with yeah. feasible sizes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So like, yeah, no, they're, um, so Sergey, I think we'll talk about some work which is in much smaller networks, as far as I understand, but, but for the Atari work and, and Q, I think they're huge, is my understanding. And the amount of data they need to train is absolutely enormous. Um, like, at least trillions, as far as I know. I mean, so, so maybe the expansion doesn't even happen, right? They're so expressive. That... Yes, it might be. So if it's, ex if it's expressive enough, then you're not going to lose so much when you project. Um, I would personally be worried about local minimum in this case, too, because most of the way they're training it, um, you know, they're doing sort of e-greedy, and, and it's a very powerful function approximator. There's no reason to assume it should go to a global optimum, but maybe there's lots of local optima that are good. But, so. but that's anyway the case, the case for deep learning. So yeah. Yeah, yes. That, yeah. But yeah, so it is very powerful, and so maybe we're not losing much in approximation error. Um, I will notice that I, it's completely exploding. Um, so uh, for those of you that were at NIPS, maybe somebody, some of you were there. It was in a 2,000-person auditorium. Uh, there was over 70 papers in the workshop. I noticed on Archive there's 100 papers in, like, I think, the last year and a half. Um, so I think also there's a lot of companies that are very excited about this because there's many problems that you can model. like. Customer relationship management doesn't have to be thought of as sort of a single step. It can be thought of a long-term discounted reward. Um, so I think there's people are very excited about using this. There's still very little theory, um, but in practice, it can do tremendously well, particularly if you have a lot of data. So one thing that I think is interesting about this area is that the initial deep RL algorithms used really, really simple exploration. They used eGreedy. They just sort of in Atari would do something simple, you know, just something random every once in a while. And that didn't work for all of the Atari games. There's some games, um, like Mond I think it's the Montezuma's Revenge, where you really need to do sort of strategic exploration where they don't do very well. But a lot of them, they do pretty well. Um, but it's not very sample efficient to do this. Like, I mean, it's just flailing some of the time. And so one of the things that um, we and other people have been thinking about um, is sort of how do we do generalization and add exploration at the same time? So one approach that we thought about recently was doing sort of posterior sampling over the state representation. 
So I before talked about how we could sample sort of a set of model parameters given a state and action space. You can imagine also sampling a state space. So given sort of a very expressive state space, you could sample sort of an aggregate of the state space and then plan within that. So you can think of it as sort of just a nested prior. And the nice thing about that is that it should hopefully speed learning, because at the beginning you're going to have a course of representation, but we can show that later on we'll still converge to the optimal policy. And the interesting thing that we noticed, so in our case we're doing sort of clustering over the state action dynamics, and so we sort of assumed that eventually in, um, if the domain really had different state action dynamics, eventually we would sort of distinguish all the state action pairs. But what we found empirically is that at least in some small domains, things like river swim, for those of you that know that, um, we don't need to do that because you don't need to make distinctions between state action pairs that are known to be bad. So in fact, you only need to sort of distinguish between state action pairs, which could be good. So we can get sort of nice jump start performance in this case. And this is also connected to some of the work on sort of things like infinite POMDPs and other approaches which try to sample the state space as well. There's been some recent nice work by Ian Osband and uh, Ben Van Roy and some others looking at how would we represent uncertainty in sort of deep RL networks. Um, the function approximator in general, if we think of it as a regressor, will just give you a single value, like a scalar. Um, and if we want to be able to reason about the uncertainty over that value, given the data we have so far, we want to have some representation of it. And so at a zeroth level approximation, they're fitting a set of deep RL networks, and then you could imagine, given that set, then being optimistic with respect to it, or sampling. Now, one thing that I think is a really interesting issue is um, that the representations we need to represent the optimal policy may be different than what we need to learn it. So I always love this example by Andrew McCollum from his thesis, where he points out that you might need a less, you might, you need a less compact <coughs> representation in order to learn the optimal policy than you need to represent it. Um, and the intuition is that if you aggregate all your states that have the same action, the resulting aggregated state space may no longer be Markov. But that's fine to represent the policy, but if you want to use something like, if you want to use Bellman equations or um, leverage the Markov property while you're learning, then you need your state space to be Markov. So he has a very nice tiny three state MDP which shows this problem. Now I think that one interesting issue for this is, um, well, what if, okay, so maybe we, you know, maybe there's some representations that um, we can't learn in, but maybe there are some times where we know that we could learn in a much more compact representation than we have access to. So maybe I want to throw in tons of features about the student. I want to throw in whether they're frustrated <coughs> and how well, you know, what their performance is and what time of day it is and all these things, and I don't know which of them matter in terms of the policy I learned. And so in general, sort of our formal sample efficiency scales as, as the specified state space, whatever we put as input, but we would like it to scale actually with the necessary state space. So whatever is sort of a smaller subset we need. Um, and one of the things we found recently, we're looking at this for factor MDPRL, um, is that we can get PACRL results that scale as a function of the in degree, so this is sort of how many parents you have, um, of the necessary features, not all of the features. So if you think about something like Atari, maybe um, if every pixel is a, is a node in your network, then maybe to specify the, the clouds or something, maybe you need a lot of different parent features. But you don't really care about the clouds when you're trying to decide what action to take. And so maybe we can, just get, we can scale just with the in degree of the features that are necessary. And so that might be much better. I think one really interesting question here is even empirically, is this true for deep reinforcement learning? Is it that the architecture that we specify doesn't matter in the sense that if there's a much smaller architecture that we need or a much more compact fe like function representation, does the amount of data we need to train at scale with that more compact representation compared to the input? And I think that would be really powerful because that means that we don't have to worry about throwing in lots of potentially unnecessary features because our sample efficiency will scale with that intrinsic dimensionality instead of the full set, at least in sort of like an order approximation. Sorry, I didn't understand. So yeah, could you explain that theorem again? So yeah, so what I'm saying here is that I'm assuming that we have a factored Markov decision process and each variable, we have a whole bunch of variables. Let's say we have 100 variables and only three of the variables are necessary to encode our optimal policy and our optimal value function. And I would like to say this that- is, the, the factoring is on the state representation. State representation. And yeah. you only need to look at three of them, let's say. Yes, and there's like you know, 97 others that I don't need Which to pay attention to. Okay. And I want to be able to scale with how many parents those three variables have instead of the parent in degree of all the other ones, which might be much higher. So in general, parents the meaning? 
Pardon? Parents. Parents mean like a, a dynamic base net. So how many other variables influence my transition model? So it's known that if you, so we're sort of trying to do feature selection and learn the structure at the same time. It's known that if you were doing just general factor and Markov decision process learning, um, that you, the number of samples you need scales essentially with your in-degree, how many parents you need to pay attention to to model the transition. And what we wanted to show is that we're going to scale for that only for the necessary features, not for all the other features that might not matter. I see. So that's probably very typical in like the game settings, right? Yes, that's, that's our guess. Is that there's probably, and probably also in education and maybe even in like consumer marketing, that there's a whole bunch of things people are doing that just don't matter in terms of the decisions we make. But we might not know what that subset is in advance. And so instead of having to do the feature selection beforehand, if we could say we're going to just automatically get to learn what that features are and do feature selection during exploration, that would be much nicer. So they're just not relevant at that instant, right? They're not relevant for representing and learning the optimal value function. Oh, period, oh, overall. So you yes. can just erase them. Oh, you can just that. erase them, but you don't know what they are. So. I see. So that's a much stronger assumption. I thought it's just instantaneously at, or around that time. No. So the idea is that you will never need them, but you don't know which ones they are. And so you want to do that feature selection while you're doing exploration. And you want to do it without sort of thinking of all possible subsets that might be you know, necessary features or not. And so this is saying we can do that. Um, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but isn't that part of the motivation for using like a deep network? Isn't that part of the what? Um, isn't that part of the motivation for using a deep network or something that like you kind of try and like automatically ignore the things that uh, that don't matter? Maybe? Yeah. So I think that it should be trying to help. I think the URL. Well, I guess to me the URL it's that you can have a really expressive representation. So if you need it, you can take you can make use of it. The thing I don't know is if the data that you require actually does scale with the full representation you put as input, or if it only scales with whatever that intrinsic dimensionality is. Okay, so for example, true. one thing that um, we're looking at right now is in a lot of the initial games, they use four frames. Um, and we analyzed it, and it looked like, uh, well, my student, uh, Christoph, analyzed this and found that for many of these cases, you only need one frame to represent the learned policy. So if you only need that one frame, then is it that the data we need would have been much smaller if we only had that one? So I think this is just open, as far as I know. I don't know what the results are, and we're going to try and see that for at least that case. So some of the other things that I think are um, very interesting right now is contextual um, uh, markup. Well, I should really say contextual decision processes. Um, this is, again, sort of going one step beyond contextual bandits towards the RL setting. Um, but it's sort of an interesting step because it could also <coughs> incorporate partial observability, where the idea is you get observations and you can take actions. Um, and they're moving to more towards like a best-in-class type framework, where we're going to have sort of a policy set we're going to try to be optimal with respect to, and we're going to hopefully have regret bounds or pack bounds that scale sort of logarithmically with the size of that set. So in general, to have optimality, the size of that set would scale exponentially with the observation space. But if you are fortunate, you might have much better results. Another thing that um, came up a lot in sort of the recent workshops is temporal abstraction. People are thinking about how do you define actions or sub-policies that take place over multiple time steps, both for things like transfer learning, um, so how we can learn across different RL instances, but also even within one. Like So for example, in some games where you have to go through multiple rooms, you could imagine learning the skill of being able to go to a door. And then you'd be able to leverage that to improve performance in the same game, so within game transfer. One of the other things that um, I think is really interesting is that in a lot of the settings of games, your, fi your, your state and action space is fixed. But in reality, in a lot of the applications we care about, you can change the state and action space. So like if I have an educational game and no one's learning with it, then I can change the activities that are in it. And so we are doing work on how do we have an algorithm automatically, proactively identify where the action space is insufficient. So we could have humans in the loop automatically create new actions to be added into the system. So it could sort of evolve the specification of the system over time to try to get to much better performance. So just to summarize, um, uh, you know, the main thing in reinforcement learning is we're trying to maximize the expected sum of uh, future awards in a stochastic domain. Um, to me, some of the most exciting things is how do we do exploration efficiently? Um, but deep RL is, is really tremendous, and I think they have taken a, a norm, or the work in that has taken an enormous step towards how do we do generalization efficiently. Though I think a lot of the existing techniques still need too much data to be practical. But I think that later today, Sergey will talk about some of the ways that they're doing it to make it practical in robotics domains, particularly by leveraging sort of information about the policy class. Thanks.
so um, I, I saw uh, something on OpenAI's blog at some point on uh, uh, some neural network playing an Atari game where it was a racing game, and, but instead of finishing the race, uh, the, the model learned to like, just go in a loop to like, pick up the same coin kind of over and over, and over again. Um, so I, I guess like, you know, detecting and correcting this kind of misspecification of, of re reward is something that human in the loop stuff does. But I, I feel like there's also like probably lots of ways that are non obvious to human that and subtle that these models can build. So is there any work in kind of I, I don't know, either constraining the model class at, at, at the start of time or somehow yeah, I yeah. So this issue of how do you specify the reward function, I think, is a huge one. And I think, uh, um, I mean, here at Berkeley, they have what the human AI for human center or human centered AI center or something like that. Um, uh, so I know a lot of people here, like Stuart Russell, are thinking hard about how do you specify the reward function correctly. Um, I think that some of the other work we were doing is how do you. It's not quite the same thing as Aurora, but if you know there's certain behaviors you want to avoid, you can put that in as for probabilistic constraints. So we're doing work on that of like, how do you ensure that, for example, this would go for general ML too. So how would you ensure your algorithm doesn't discriminate? So you can put in constraints to make sure that the algorithm will not discriminate. Uh, so I think, but often there is unexpected behavior if you just specify the reward function, and maybe in some cases it's easier to demonstrate the direct behavior you want, or it really needs to be a dialogue between people and you know, the agents. Thank our speaker here.